this was a very small project that Khaled and I had, uh, I guess, for a few months. And I primarily work in discrete element methods. And we had developed a number of new types of techniques in that area. And we decided to start working in the area of swarms. Uh, there was a long history of that in UC Berkeley. Uh, there's a, quite a bit of drone activity and coordinated drone activity. And so we were trying to develop very fast algorithms to do very fast swarm mapping to minimize the amount of energy that one of these little gadgets uses because they only last about 20 or 30 minutes at most with their batteries. So the idea was to optimize their motion to do as much ground coverage as possible and then basically stream the data back. That was the idea, was very fast calculation. So this came from sort of the, the algorithms for this came from the whole discrete element method uh, community, which all of you guys know very well from civil engineering because that's basically where it started. Primarily our interest was in harnessing very fast calculations of interacting bodies, particles in this case for a spray, uh, how they break apart, how they move, and translating that into motion of swarms where the actuation then is actually the thrust of the swarms and its RF frequency interaction between the different objects. So the idea was to mimic these fast calculations by treating them as particles and doing their interactions in a non-local way using the radio frequency as the interacting forces. So the idea uh, was relatively straightforward and I'll give you a sort of an idea of how all of that works. The primary interest in this was to mimic, initially several years ago, uh, swarm behavior of starlings, uh, as you notice how they, they move. And in this kind of a simulation, we typically have three groups of objects that we're going to deal with. Obstacles, or things that uh, might get in the way. The little blue guys, which are the interacting UAVs. And then the red thing, which is the target. So in this case, for example, these guys are moving around and we've programmed them in such a way to avoid the green and go after the red. However, they autonomously decide by themselves, because there's no central processing unit, based upon their proximal distance within one another, they determine what motion is optimal from an energy uh, savings point of view. So the idea was, again, always try to minimize the amount of energy usage of the objects and economize their path. Okay? So where all this stuff came from, at least for us, so I have to give you sort of a little bit of background of why uh, this occurred, was a lot that had to do with additive manufacturing. Uh, additive manufacturing, uh, as many of you know, at least in civil engineering, I know it's, it's relatively prevalent in mechanical engineering, it's dominant, is essentially we grind up slurries of materials, uh, we make mixtures of them, we put them in some kind of a hopper, we have a robotic arm of some kind, the robot is then programmed and drops the material and the idea is, is that we use a discrete element method formulation to calculate fast interactions of these things as the objects hit the ground. We then also have the multi-physics of, for example, a laser that comes in, heats up the material, processes it and so forth. So these techniques of course are probably, uh, as I could see, someone was using PFEM uh, in uh, open seas and of course one of the co-developers of this method was Eugenio Onyate who also is the PFEM GID dude as well. So a lot of this has to do with uh, that kind of interaction. The, the idea is, is to mimic these kinds of machines and there, there's an opportunity there for civil engineers to think about it. I'll just show you what one of these machines looks like. This is a DMG Mori laser tech. Uh, it granulates metal into particulates. It sprays them in an argon jet it, uh, as you'll see in a moment, it basically takes G-code uh, from a 3D printer, uh, but it's a 3D printer on steroids, as you'll see in a moment. It's going to spray titanium powder on the ground. Uh, it has a laser that is coaxial with the uh, machine, so it's melting the particles on the fly as the uh, particles are hitting the surface. This is a factor of five speed up, so it's of course building, in this case it's going to be an impeller for a turbine. Uh, the laser basically is fusing the particles on contact and of course to simulate this thing it's obvious a discrete element method would probably be a pretty good idea because a continuum approach is not going to be easy. So this kind of technique of course is very flexible because you can have an object that can move around in 3D. For example in this case it's on a five axis spindle. The machine is moving the part around, the spray is coming down and basically melting the stuff on contact and it keeps doing this sort of ballet of taking something, moving, then something else comes in, sprays it. But the interesting thing about these kinds of technologies is also they do what is called subtractive manufacturing. So this is of course the additive part where materials are being added, but it will then also include a routing device or a milling machine uh, 
and then basically it'll grind off all of the stuff to machine tolerances and it goes back and forth doing this stuff and of course you can see it's advantageous to use a discrete element method of course because you're breaking things apart so again it's sensible so the idea and the impetus for creating very fast algorithms was primarily to mimic this these types of complicated processes which is of course going to be very similar to uh, the swarm stuff as we'll see in just a moment okay so that's the main idea uh, we basically build a lot of different structures using these techniques. Uh, the techniques are primarily used to selectively uh, control the dopants as we build up several layers of materials. The idea is to grind up things into nanoscale powders, uh, have binders that are also ground up into usually micron-sized materials. We have then micron-sized flakes and then also ceramics and we usually take these four material groups, grind them together and then use the fast numerical techniques to be able to deal with this stuff. Again, the bottom line is at the end of the day, we then have a technique that does fast calculations of interactions of these objects, essentially using a discrete element method, but using very fast interaction rules. As you'll see in a moment, I'll show you how all that works, also in the context of swarms and mapping of structures. But at least this is the idea of where this stuff came from. And of course, the interesting thing about these is, is that in these kinds of calculations, you can also do non-local calculations, meaning they don't necessarily have to be in contact. They can have electrical interaction, and in this case, indeed, they do. This is a granular material which normally would have hit and splattered all over the place, but in fact, because it's electrically charged, they have a tendency to agglomerate together, and in fact, they produce something that's akin to surface tension or fluid-saturated soils. So essentially, they have some fluid-like ability uh, due to the fact that there is now a pseudo-surface tension. As you'll see in, such a, in just a moment, this thing starts to recongeal into a droplet, and it's a mixture of two different types of, of particles. Particle number one, the smaller ones are binders. Particle number two are sometimes what we call a functionalizing particle. It's usually electrically or magnetically sensitive because we want to endow the property of the material with some kind of fancy property, and the binder is just there because it's easy to form and keep everything together. Then the laser kicks in, fuses the stuff together, and then we go on uh, and do all kinds of good stuff. Okay, that's the motivation of where lots of this stuff came from. So, how does it work? Well, primarily we have uh, the dynamics of the system, which is essentially F equals MA for each of the particles. Uh, if you consider the position vectors of each of the particles, the mass I is the counter for as many particles as you like. You have near field interaction. That's important uh, in the context of swarms, meaning that the particles can have some kind of action that doesn't necessarily require contact. They can be electrically charged, so there's going to be some uh, long range interactions that are non-local. You also have contact and friction, which is the normal DEM, basically uh, normal contact, frictional contact, depending upon what model you like. Uh, then you have, of course, external electric fields and external magnetic fields, and then you have what, what is sometimes referred to as the Lorentz force, meaning that the material actually can start to bend around corners, and that's, in, of course, due to the fact that if you have a magnetic field, charged material will start to bend and curl which is, of course, what those things do. You also have, at the same time, heat transfer. Uh, theta is the thermal variable here. And then you have conduction, impact, and sources. And again, then you have heat transfer. So depending upon what particles are in contact with which other ones, they may make thermal contact and exchange heat, but they don't necessarily have to. And of course, you can have external sources that are not necessarily contact-based. At the end of the day, this is what you get. If you get a blob of stuff, you shoot it at the target, it splatters all over the place, as we think it would. If we electrically charge it, you get very controlled deposition, and of course the colors in this case are temperatures, and you get very, a nice, very coherent droplet which you can control. So again, the motivation behind uh, the swarm stuff was, well, if we can control the motion of these particles with these kinds of electric fields, maybe we can do the same thing on a macroscopic scale and control many flying objects in a very similar fashion. Okay? So the idea is, again, you have Lots of interacting objects, F equals MA. You have some type of interaction law that is sometimes referred to as a near field thing, and this is where we get into the swarm business. Depending upon what you choose for alpha and beta, which is what you would program a swarm member to do, you can get interactions where these things are stable, don't come together, cluster together, and so you can start to think about you know, pr primitive types of control. The more they attract, the more these things will come together, the more they repel, the more they stay apart, 
and they get to some equilibrium state depending upon how far or near they are as well. That makes things easy to program and very fast to calculate. Okay. Uh, the Hertzian stuff, just for those of you that are in civil engineering and mechanical as well, basically again we have a whole library of contact laws, although for most swarm type mechanics contact is the enemy. If these things are flying around and they're quadcopters, if they come in contact, most likely they're not going to bounce off of each other. There's going to be a problem. So clearly the contact laws are just simply to show that there is some analogy to granular med media. At the end of the day, the calculations then are relatively simple from F equals MA. You integrate forward in time, uh, the uh, balance of linear momentum. You can integrate each of the different types of forcing functions, the near field, contact, friction, electromagnetics with different integrators although typically we use usually an implicit uh, trapezoidal type rule. You integrate one more time to get the position. You integrate also the thermal states if this thing happens to be something where thermal states are important. And of course if you want you can consider rotations although it's usually not very important for the, for the applications we're going to consider today. But of course you can integrate the balance of angular momentum and integrate also as well the spin of these objects if needed. Okay, so the algorithms are fast for the following reason, and why they're fast is, is as follows. If you take an object like this, let's say a typical object in a stream or a swarm of these uh, types of materials, and they'll just color that in the dark black here, and I freeze all of the other, pos the other members in the uh, calculation, I can update only this as a decoupled one degree of freedom problem with all of these other guys, uncoupled. So momentarily if I freeze the position of everything else, I'm only actively letting this guy move around. I calculate the state of that uh, object. I then move to the next object. I freeze what I had just calculated and all the other guys and I do this over and over again sweeping through the entire system only solving one problem at a time. This decouples all of the problems. It allows for very simple parallelism if, if you like. But at the same time, it also frees you from any matrices. And that's the key thing. This is an implicit scheme, but is completely matrix free in the sense that there is no inversion of some type of a coupled system. You're essentially using you know, what some of us old timers know as the Jacobi or Gauss-Seidel type method for finite differences. Effectively, we're taking an object, freezing everything in the system, solving for it, moving to the next object, freezing everything, updating that variable, and we keep sweeping through these things as a variable node in the system. This allows all of the calculations to be done extremely quickly. However, we have to iterate, and the iterations you can form in an abstract form that looks something like a Picard iteration. So effectively what you do is you solve for the position for a particle, you update all of the variables, and you keep sweeping back and forth here in this red equation here. No matrices, but it depends upon what the spectral radius is of this, of this system is for it to converge or not to converge. So the problem there, of course, is depending upon the system variables, you have to adaptively select a time step to allow this to converge. It's not simply for free. Depending upon what the time step size is, this thing may, may not converge, and that depends upon the spectral radius. So again, you have to check the eigenvalues of the system. If the eigenvalues are less than one, it will converge, and that, of course, is dictated by the time step size. All right, so the bottom line is, is how do you use such a thing? You take a glob of material, you shoot it against a wall, it splatters all over the place. The way we like to use it is as follows, at least in mechanical engineering, before we get to the swarm businesses, we shoot the object, hit the surface. The idea is to use it as a very fast design tool where we set what we would like this object to do. We take an initial configuration, we say, look, shoot these particles, make them splatter, and make them splatter inside this zone please figure out what the system parameters have to be to make that happen. So now it starts to become an inverse problem of we want, we have. We want to figure out what the parameters need to be to get what we want. So for example, if we take an object and we just shoot a granular media at a surface, it's going to splatter all over the place as we would think. Uh, if we electrify the material just a little bit, they start to become a little bit more cohesive and they start to then form some kind of a coherent object. If you shoot it with just the right uh, electric field, you get something that sticks perfectly and then you get a nice target. So the idea then for mapping of a system, if I want to map an area, some domain after a disaster, and this is the domain that I'd like to map things over uniformly, 
really what I want to do is I want to figure out the inverse problem of if I'm starting with releasing a set of swarm or UAVs here, how do I get them to become like this after a certain amount of time? That's the mathematical problem that we were dealing with. Okay, so swarms. So here's the, here's the basic idea and the general setup for most of the time for these swarms kinds of calculations. We have some goal that we want to get to. We have objects where we start with. The use of the word swarm is obvious. It's from, of course, the biological stuff of bugs and birds and things of that sort. We've got obstacles and we'd like to get the objects from here to there in a minimum amount of time, minimum amount of energy, some type of constraint. The model, of course, is relatively straightforward, just like with the granular media. We have F equals MA. We've got the position of all of the little particles, the swarm members, their masses, the member-member interaction. So again, quadcopter to quadcopter, what they do, how they talk to each other, that's represented by this force. Member to target. So here's the target, whatever it's trying to get to, the interaction between it and the target. The target is usually stationary although in some cases it might be moving, but again, member target interaction and then member obstacle interaction. So the name of the game is how to optimize what these forces need to be to get the goal that we want. Pictorially, it's interactions of the swarms, member to member, member to object, member to target, and we want to basically mimic these forces based upon what we can see or glean from synthetic swarms, meaning much of the calculations we did were based upon psychological studies of how uh, starlings behave. Uh, starlings are, are the most uh, stark uh, reminder of exactly how complicated these can be. In this case, they were evading a predator. Uh, but depending upon whether they're going after bugs, mosquitoes, if it's feeding time, if there's a hawk, they will, of course, adjust their calculations accordingly. What's interesting about a starling is that, you know, it has stereographic vision. It's got basically two eyes on the side of its head because, of course, it's prey. Predators always have their eyes in the front, prey always on the side. So typically the idea is, is that, or what they've been able to do, there was a study in PNS about 10 years ago, which essentially showed that starlings keep about seven other birds in their brain at any given time. And it's always the same seven birds. So when they're in a swarm, they will tag seven birds that they want to stay near to, only those seven, not their nearest neighbors, and they attempt to always keep as close as possible to those seven. It's a very strange algorithm, so it's somewhat counterintuitive, because of course, at first you would think, well, they'll always try to, try to stay near their nearest neighbor. That actually will not predict these complicated patterns. In fact, nearest neighbor will simply make things cluster together and make little balls. Uh, these kinds of very complicated objects require something that's a little bit uh, deeper than that. And it turns out that for some reason, uh, the uh, swarms of uh, starlings have that kind of behavior. Another animal that's, of course, relatively common are locusts. I mean, locusts, they have a completely different psychology as well because they're cannibals. So basically what happens is a locust is attempting to eat another locust ahead of it at any given time. So typically what will happen is, is you're trying to eat the guy in front of you and not be eaten by the thing behind you. <laughs> so there are many kinds of objects, depending upon their control algorithm, will develop completely different <laughs> types of behaviors. I can only imagine what that would be like on the BART or something like that, where uh, <laughs> anyway. Okay, so there are a lot of these gadgets out there. Uh, Khaled and I bought a whole bunch of them. I think we bought probably 10 or 15 of these guys. We did all kinds of crazy tests with them. Uh, in general, they're a dime a dozen now. They're pretty cheap. Uh, you know, you can get everything obviously for 30, 40 bucks. Uh, they're not very good. Uh, typically, the, pr the main sticking point still to this day is the battery. Basically, about 20 minutes and then you're done. So the question is if you're in a post-earthquake or post-disaster, fire, whatever, whatnot, what can you do with 20 minutes? In other words, of, of flight time. So that's the idea. So there are many different possibilities depending upon what you want to map. Uh, if you want to map, for example, power outage and power cells, they may have a different topology. Uh, if they have regional food distribution centers and you want to map what those are like, again, different topology. Water cells, satellite cells, traffic cells, uh, internet, Depending upon which type of configuration you want, this thing may, you may want to cover it in a completely different manner. So the question is, how do you program these guys to go over all of this stuff in a minimum amount of time where the flight time is approximately 20 minutes 
to get uniform coverage uh, you know, after a disaster. So again, the mathematical formulation is as follows. We have member-member interaction, member-object inter uh, obstacle interaction, member-target. The usual mathematical problem we dealt with was we have a blob of stuff, we've got a target, we've got the obstacles, and the idea was how do we get these obstacles out, or the objects around the obstacles in a minimum amount of time, how do we make it autonomous, and how do we get to the object that we're after. So again, the mathematical setup is F equals MA. The MM, member-member interaction, has the following three variables, how attractive they are, how repulsive they are, and then exponents to tell us how strong this interaction is. In other words, does it, when they get close, do they really start to ramp up and really try to repel? If it's linear, beta, of course, is one, quadratic, cubic, so forth. These are just the proximal distances between the nearest neighbors. Same idea for the target. We have some kind of attractive thing, obviously, because that's the thing we want to get to. And then, of course, we have obstacles, which is repulsive. So depending upon the obstacles, it will tell you how much repulsion you need to have, how much uh, attractiveness you need to have to the target. And of course, all of these variables play off of each other. So the free variables in the system are alpha 1, beta 1, alpha 2, beta 2, alpha mt, beta mt, alpha mo, beta mo. So roughly 10 variables that we got to deal with, uh, considering that all the swarm members are the same. Of course, if you wanted to, you could go really fancy and make each of the swarms have a different control law. We didn't. They just simply have 10 variables. It's a highly non-convex optimization problem, clearly, depending upon what we set as the objective. There could be many possible combinations of these parameters that might deliver the same type of result. There's also side constraints. The constraints are, for example, minimize the amount of energy. So in this case, our simple calculation was one half mv squared. That's the amount of kinetic energy that's being used to move these things around. So we're attempting to minimize that as we're doing the path planning. So the idea is, is that we would relate, that's proportional to the fuel usage of these things, how much kinetic energy they're using up. We would basically integrate that over the path, and then we would run these calculations over and over again in a repeated fashion. We used essentially a genetic algorithm, which is a relatively, you know, as we all know, is a relatively simple fuzzy optimization scheme, and those seem to work rather well. And the objective of this was then to take these objects move and get to a target in a minimum amount of time. So let's look at a little bit more tangible example. So again, as I said, the number of uh, parameters in the system in this kind of a genetic algorithm are all of the coefficients of these interacting objects. We set these up as a genetic string. We uh, take a test set of these parameters. We run it forward. We evaluate the performance. We run several hundred of these. We take the best performers, we keep them, we kill off the worst performers, and we keep doing this recursively over and over and over again so that we can get a scheme that works in a non-derivative, non-convex fashion. So final little example, here's how it works. We have several objects in an area that we'd like to visit post-disaster. We've got a set of swarm members here. We use the genetic algorithm to optimize what is the minimum amount of energy use of these objects to come and touch each one of the objects in the system. That was the objective. What you'll find is very interesting. It, would, it was counterintuitive to me is that the, in, in hindsight it makes sense, but in the beginning I would have never predicted it. The swarms actually break apart into little hunting packs. They start to break apart, look for little objects on their own, and then recongeal afterwards. And that seems to be the most energy efficient for this particular configuration. So here's how it works. They, start to move around and as you can see they've now broken into several different hunting parties going each time they come to a, a one of the sites it turns green so we had a calculation that simply said once you get within a few meters of this thing we tag that as being seen it's of no longer any interest move to the next object and the algorithm then swept through this whole thing so this is how it works they start to break apart they keep looking. What's interesting, right at the very end, there's one lonely one here at the end. Nobody's been able to get to. They all now see that one as their target, and then they're out of the system. So again, just for that configuration, that was what the optimal choice was. If the configuration was different, I'm sure that there would be a completely different way of breaking it apart. But the main point of this was there's no way humanly we would be able to figure that out. The algorithm figures it out for us.
it's entirely autonomous. So where we're at right now, and I mean it was just a short uh, one or two month project, is basically to translate more of the psychology of these kinds of objects into more sophisticated control algorithms and depending upon what happens we'll decide that shortly. I just brought this up just simply because the state is burning down. We do a lot of calculations also with fire mitigation using the same types of algorithms for sparks. Basically the same interaction when we do machining work. Again, F equals MA, but again we have gravity of something being machined, objects, uh, hot incandescent objects being uh, launched. We compute the drag of these guys, the thermodynamics using the convection, radiation, and uh, drag heating. We then basically do the calculations of if an object gets launched from a machining site and you have wind and the colors are indicating the temperature, what is the danger zone and how many meters around this thing will materials be hot enough to actually cause some burning? There's a recent paper we just finished on this which is basically tells you how far can little metallic uh, flakes actually go. It's surprisingly uh, quite a bit. So the, the key parameter here is how long is the loft time and how long is the cooling time. If the cooling time is shorter than the loft time, what that means is, or longer than the loft time, it means that it gets lofted, but by the time it hits the ground it's still hot enough to actually burn the stuff on the ground. That's the key non-dimensional parameter in most of these machining types of uh, safety situations. How long does it take to cool? versus how long it gets to be loft. If you take that ratio, it's less than one. That means something is going to burn if it hits the ground. And in fact, the car fire, I mean, the car fire, not a car, but the, the famous now famous car fire was actually apparently formed or uh, done by someone sitting with a hammer. And then apparently it was a spark from a hammer. At least that's, if you believe the New York Times, that's what they said yesterday. So if that's, uh, that's a big if. Anyway, so there's three books. If we're in the UC system, they're free. There's all kinds of these fast interaction methods, and I'll end the talk now. Thank you very much. So, if we imagine here has a fleet of these uh, drones of 10,000 or whatever, and an earthquake happen in the Bay Area, and we send them out, and they go visit every house, take a picture, and we can do damage assessment in a few seconds, maybe the object that will be left out, my house and below or something. Yeah. But uh, probably going to design the algorithm. I mean, these are relatively Which obvious obvious uses of these things. I mean, th part of the problem is, is that the fluid mechanics of this is quite complicated. I mean, at least in a fire, of course, the problem is, is the, the turbulence that is associated with the fire burning up in the eddies will simply destroy most of the normal types of drones we're dealing with now, I mean, it, it, irrespective of the heat. So I think part of the problem with, with much of this technology is, is usually they're done in such ideal pristine testing conditions. They're never really put out into the field where there's soot. There's a huge amount of uh, activity, and that's one of the drawbacks. I've, we've done lots of field tests. Uh, and it turns out nothing matches what we do in the algorithms when things start to get windy and sooty. So that, that's been always a, a real dilemma, but again, a possibility for using some of the state's uh, largesse from all of its taxes. Maybe better drones. So I have a quick question and then others can. So, so everything is nice when it comes to laying out the, the, the governing equations and developing the algorithm to solve the problem. But as you said, in a real condition, there would be unforeseen, which right. is fine. But how about in terms of the hardware? How can we make these uh, drones really behave as? Well, I think it's so. So I think so. I think so. I think the key thing, is, at least in control theory, it's redundancy. Basically, you know, the the way the drones are right now is that if one fails, it fails and it's out of the system. If you want to have, you know, something that really mimics what we see in animal behavior, there has to be some type of fault tolerance, huge fault tolerance, meaning that if one of the objects goes out of the system, the entire swarm doesn't fall apart, that the redundancy, something else comes in and picks up the slack. If you want to use that kind of an algorithm, you have to have a lot of onboard computing. And the problem with the onboard computing, that's weight. 
So if you have weight, you can't really carry cameras. So there's always this trade-off in terms of how long these things can operate and how expensive you want to make them. I actually look at it in a more utilitarian point of view. If I had a huge amount of area that I wanted to cover, and I would put these things on a one-way mission. Basically, I mean, if each of them costs 20, 30 bucks, you put a camera on them, I don't care if they come back or not. I mean, if it's a matter of sending out three or 400 of these things times 30 bucks, it's nothing compared to, you know, the post-disaster issues. So I think a lot of the onboard stuff is a little bit overblown, as well as the ability for this stuff to return. If you put them on a one-way mission where you just simply say, photograph everything in your path and stream it back, that's, I think, probably the most effective for a disaster point of view. I mean, uh, from a hobbyist point of view, not, but, you know, obviously for the relative to the cost of what is going on on the ground, one-way missions probably might not be a bad idea. So I, hope, I don't know if that answers the question. Uh, okay. I would say research has to be at least 10 years ahead of practice. Maybe I, we are... To be honest, I think, I, think, I think the problem is, is that it's so much overblown in making them more and more sophisticated for the types of activities we might need in civil engineering to do post-disaster stuff, they don't have to be sophisticated at all. They have to have a pretty good camera. And it might be advantageous for them to crash because once they crash and we know where they are, they can still beam back information of what the temperature and what the conditions are on the ground. So it isn't that somehow they're you know, completely finished once they run out of gas. It's just simply that they're not going to be able to take pictures anymore. But they still do transmit some information. Yes. Yeah. There's there's sh there's shielding effects. I mean, if you do the fluid mechanics, in many cases you can get shielding effects. In fact, that's why in, in some cases when you see ducks, right, they fly in a V type condition. The guy in the very front is really getting the brunt of it, and then the ones in the back are not. So certainly more sophisticated control algorithms are possible. And we played around with like, you know, only taking three birds into account, five birds into account, 11 birds into account. And the conditions and the configurations vary dramatically. So it isn't that somehow it's just a minor thing. Slight changes in how these things interact with each other make gigantic differences in the configurations. For maximum area coverage, we set the genetic algorithm simply as follows. Cover the entire area. And it figured out an algorithm that was completely different in terms of what it wanted to interact with or not, because what we did was we also set the so-called radius of influence uh, of what it would interact with also as a variable. So it, it doesn't make any sense that if there was a huge number of swarms, that if somebody's over here, that its action is going to directly affect that guy. So depends upon how big that radius of influence is also determines how big the area coverage in an optimal way so I did do some uh, initial uh, calculations of some uncertainty quantification meaning that if there was you know a breakdown in the system or there was some spontaneous disturbance what would be the robustness of the response but I couldn't get anything definitive because it seemed like a case-by-case -case, uh, fashion. So really what then I defaulted on was doing the calculations as fast as possible simply because then I can reconfigure as opposed to trying to come up with some catch-all idea of how things might behave with a much fancier control algorithm. The idea was then simply just calculate it as fast as possible and just re readjust. Yes. I have a question. Where do you do the computations for the action problem? Do you do it? Why can't you do it on the individual instance? Wait. I mean, the problem is, is that the drones we were dealing with were relatively cheap ones with just a camera. We certainly could do the calculations on board. I mean, from the simulation point of view, we can do anything you want. I mean, I basically, you can put everybody knows everything about everybody. That means calculations are on board. So, for example, I'm a swarm member. And instantaneously, for some reason, I know what everybody else is doing. You, not necessarily. But I mean, would that be advantageous to know what 
everybody is doing? Or do I only know what my next layer of neighbors are, or do I not know what anybody does? So there's a, there are different varying degrees of that. If you translate that into hardware, that means, of course, you've got to do some more onboard computing. The more information you intend to gather, the more information has to be processed on board. So that means weight. So it was always this trade-off between weight and computation. But the way I did the calculations, it was all centralized. Basically, everybody sent me the information, and then I would send it back out. But if, you know, and it was RF. But of course, there could be some cases where it's optical, in the sense that it's line of sight. Uh, we tried a bit of that. It wasn't very successful, meaning that, you know, based upon the cameras on board, they see what's around them, and then they determine a collision avoidance algorithm based upon what they see. Very expensive, never worked. Uh, basically, RF seemed to be the only viable way to do this. I mean, radio frequency. Yeah, I mean, again, it's the same kind of issue with autonomous systems for cars. I mean, I think it's, you know, if you go out there, it seems like it would be a fantasy to believe that, you know, it's going to be all autonomous. I, because I think part of the problem is if one actor in the system is not autonomous. So in other words, if everybody was autonomous, I could believe in autonomous driving. But if you have one guy who's a little bit stoned or had a bad day or checking their phone and is not rational, that's enough to just the control algorithm simply cannot handle it. And we have a huge controls group at UC Berkeley that have been working on this for probably 20 years continuously. It's the biggest activity in our department and they've really gotten nowhere. I mean, they've tried every possible thing in the book. It just simply, at the end of the day, the robustness aspect of this is just not there. I saw a hand here. Well, yes. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning the uh, possibility of using uh, PCM and uh, you mentioned the uh, Yes. Uh, do you see any application of continuum-based uh, method? Because PCM is a continuum-based or are like uh, uh, SPA so, so my group, we've, we're all kind of particle method people. Uh, for the swarm activity, we've only used DEM. Uh, but in terms of the other types of, you know, manufacturing stuff, I think a large number of students, because I usually like to let them choose the method they want, uh, their MPM, the material point method, seems to be the one that everybody is gravitating towards right now. Uh, for a while, it was SPH. Uh, but I would say, I have a group of about 15 students, I'd say two or three are PFEM guys, five or six maybe are FEM, all the rest are PFEM, MPM, that kind of thing. And I think the problem is, is that PFEM is a continuum-based method, and when these things break apart, of course, it's a problem. I mean, so I think, you know, really, truly things breaking completely apart is a problem even for PFEM. So I think uh, my default is to use MPM, discrete element methods, but of course they have background meshes if you do this. So always when they say they're really meshless, that's, that's obviously not true. There's a, There's a background grid where they project onto, do the calculation, go back. Personally for me, I mean I code all of this stuff myself and I still go straight with DEM or FEM but all the other intermediate stuff seems to be somewhat ad hoc. Not bad, it's just simply that I really can't make any general statements about what's better or worse. But I am partial to PFEM, I have to say. I mean, it keeps getting better and better, and Eugenio has such a huge group that he's trying to get them to work. I was just with him last week, and we co-edited a journal together, and uh, he seems to you know, keep making progress. So I don't know what variations of PFEM are out now, but, you know, the early on one was somewhat primitive, but it seems to get more sophisticated each time I see him. So, I don't know, it probably has all kinds of elements that are, you know, very fancy by now. But I'd say PFEM is a pretty good bet. MPM or PFEM. SPH, it's great for movies, but that's about it. I think accuracy would be hard to imagine that you can get anything real out of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It somehow has captured the imagination of people, but it's, but it's not cheap. I mean, you basically have to have a gigantic Eulerian grid that encompasses the entire domain 
and then you basically have little particles that move around and you project them onto this background grid, which means you've got to basically compute on the background grid all the time. That makes it unbelievably expensive. I mean, you can solve very complicated problems, but numerically, it's a, it's a beast. Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. It's just to, it's it and it's unclear whether it's really bijective in the sense that if you're mapping from the continuum to the particles and then you go back to the particles to the continuum, you lose something in this. So it, it's not a bijective situation where you really are losing stuff. There's some type of hysteresis in the mapping. Yeah. Uh, my question was uh, the matrix B issue. There was a slide where you Yes. It is really matrix free. It's just it's just like uh, finite differences in SOR or Jacobi, where we went node by node by node and updated. The particles are the nodes. What is the residual that you're doing over? Is that so basically what's happening is the following. Yes. So I'm, so I'm taking this particle here, and I'm freezing everybody else in the system. So imagine all of you guys are particles, and I'm a particle. I calculate how I'm moving, but I'm assuming none of you guys are moving. At an instant, I calculate my state, then I'm frozen, and the next guy, we unfreeze him. We calculate his state based upon everybody else freezing. We freeze him go to the next guy, unfreeze him, and keep doing this and sweeping through the entire system. We do this over and over again iteratively. Once we converge, meaning relative error, meaning what I was the previous iteration minus what I am now, we keep going through this procedure of trying to minimize the relative error until we basically get below a tolerance, and then we go to the next time step. It's fully implicit staggering within an implicit time stepping scheme. So nothing is explicit. So mathematically speaking, it looks like this. It looks like I have a particle at a given time step L. Uh, this is the iteration counter K. These are all of the forces multiplied times time steps and integrators and so forth. But at the end of the day, I get an updated value of this at a given time step. I go back and keep doing this over and over again. And the convergence looks something like this in the abstract form. All of this junk here is hidden in this operator G. If the spectral radius of the operator G is less than one, this thing will contract and become a contraction mapping. Well, let me ask a hypothetical Let's say you have four models traveling in space, but you're going to show the state of the system. Yes. Then they, in the next second, they'll go into another state. Yes. In that, they may have some collision. Right. Yes. So let's say that in one setting, you take the initial time, you iterate. Yeah, but since it's fully implicit, it will actually self-correct. We don't have an order issue. In other words, if I started with that particle or this particle, that particle, it's completely insensitive to it because it keeps recorrecting. So that's the interesting thing apart, uh, about this, is if you set the error tolerance tight enough, it doesn't matter whether you started with particle 101 and started this thing, or particle 10,000, or particle 9, it will recorrect it would not be that way if it was explicit, meaning that I did it just for this guy, I did one iteration, and then I went to the next time step. I yeah. Yes. So that's the thing. Adaptively, what we do is we adaptively control the time step size. So what happens is, is if we go through several iterations and it's not converging, we reset the thing at the beginning of the time step, contract the time step accordingly. There's an algorithm by which we make the time step smaller and we recompute. If it doesn't converge again, we contract the time step and we recompute. So it's actively controlling the time steps to force convergence at every time step. That's the key thing. It has to be adaptive. If I set the time step a priori at the beginning of the calculation, there's no telling whether it would converge or not. That's correct. In fact, that's exactly what this parameter is. In fact, if you look at this here, it's a wave speed. That's in fact the, the, the speed at which the information is traveling through the system.
So it's essentially how fast the information is transmitted throughout the entire system at each iteration. That's controlled entirely by the size of the time step and you can see it's to the power two. So it's quadratic. That is correct. So if, so if I force this guy, all of this junk here, and I took the tangent of it, and I computed exactly what that thing, that would be G, and if depending upon the spectral radius of G, meaning its, its eigenvalues, if its eigenvalues are less than one, it will converge. If it's not, it won't. So the obvious thing to do is to control the time step because it directly scales the size of this operator. Bigger delta T, bigger operator meaning slower convergence. But of course, that's advantageous too. You don't want to have super small time steps for nothing because then you're wasting your computations with unnecessarily small time steps. So what this algorithm also does is it enlarges the time steps as well. In other words, if it finds out that it's converging too quickly, for the next time step it's going to make the time steps a little bit bigger so you don't waste as much computation doing needless iterations. So you as the user might set I want to do only 100 iterations per time step. It will automatically find the sweet spot of what those time steps should be so that it always delivers in 100 time steps and 100 iterations and no more or less than that to converge to the answer. So I have a, like, a side question. Yes. So, so if, if the swarms are drawn, then we know how many of those. Yes. But, but like in some of the applications you do, like in additive manufacturing, how do you decide on the number of there are actually objects the, there, there are actual objects in the system. I mean, so for example, in this case, let's say it's a Is droplet. It no, no, no. These are actual objects that are being ground up into pieces of material. I mean... This was a paint or something. Like you do something with I, I know, but the calculations we usually do are like we have a droplet of a certain micron in size. It might have 2,000 granulated pieces of material and 100 functionalizing particles. We know exactly how much is coming out of the dispenser in a blob. So these are real objects. These are not nodes in a system. They actually are really spherical, and they are actually a certain number that is very uh, controlled. What's interesting about this, which is different than DEM, usually in soils we have to apologize and say yes we're doing spherical particles and yes we know they're not really spherical but in this case I don't have to apologize the electrical people really are making them spherical because that's what's controllable and that's what's deliverable in terms of monodispersed powders they want them spherical so actually how these are produced they take the raw material they melt it they, they allow it to vaporize for example a metal it makes metallic rain, and then depending upon how quickly they condense them, they get particles of a certain size, but they are consistently of a certain uh, diameter, which is important because if you want to do very controlled microelectronics, you want these things to be spherical, no stress concentrators. You also want them to be very controlled in terms of the volume fraction. So they really are spherical. Yeah, but Jose knows all this stuff we <laughs> talk about. <laughs> Doing part oh, there you go. Any other questions? That's very exciting. All right. Okay. So, so we